Okay, now the last time we spoke, I introduced you as the managing director of Waterstones, but you've added to that title. And now have the equivalent at Barnes & Noble, though I still retain the Waterstones. And indeed, still retain the dog books. So how does that help your competitive edge now that you've got all of these bookstores? I don't think it remotely impacts the competitive edge because they're different markets, but it, at least it, it gives one the experience, first of evidently, of dog books to bring to Waterstones and now Waterstones to bring to Barnes & Noble. The, the scale of the businesses is, is increasing. But actually, the, the fundamental challenge is exactly the same. Barnes & Noble that we're seeing today is not so very different from the Waterstones of 2011 and hopefully the same recipes and the same sort of attempt to shift the culture of the business will have the same uh, impact. So you can't get a better deal buying books then? Uh, well that certainly isn't part of it. You get a better deal buying books if you are a better partner to publishers for sure and if you particularly if you make their world easier to operate in and more profitable and then you know, all things being equal they will share a little bit of that I, I hasten to say a little bit of it with you uh, but a lot of what we did at Waterstones was just run the place much more efficiently drive out returns become a much more dependable and reliable partner for publishers um, and sell more books um, and if you do that then generally the publisher will like you a bit more Is it the case that they purchase shelf space over here now? Over here yes that, that's the, the model which is as you know is basically the retail model for most uh, bookstore chains uh, frankly of worldwide uh, yes publishers buy space um, but you can buy your space in different ways than do as they do here which is effectively put the same offer everywhere you know that works for supermarkets and it works for airport retailers it, it really doesn't work for stock holding uh, bookstores of this sort because that's what you did in, in England, is you did away with that. Yes, and we effectively sought to allow the booksellers in each individual store to curate themselves appropriately for their market. It's not that we don't want to sell the books that would otherwise have been put everywhere, but we want to sell them where they sell and not pile them up and then return them from places where they don't sell. Right. Uh, and that, you know, logically is something that clearly publishers understand. It's just that they didn't. They've never trusted the bookseller to actually do their job well enough to allow that those mechanics to go on. As once you get their trust that you are actually doing well, then they're happy enough. So, how does it up, uh, work over here with Barnes and Noble? I, I know one of the things that was quite striking about what you said the last time we spoke was uh, that you gave the managers more freedom, and they didn't know what to do with it. What's the case over here now? Well, I'm not sure they don't know what to do with it, but when you have, as is the case in this country, where you've been for many, 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 many years, you've been told precisely what to do, and you've had to follow uh, the diktat from you know, head office. Uh, when that diktat is removed, it's kind of difficult. You've really got to put your thinking cap back on and engage. Um, but we've just walked through a store here, um, which is changed itself over the last couple of weeks um, and so there are people who can do it and the but pace at which we do it will be you know will vary by the capabilities of the book selling teams in each store and the bookstore here is at Union Square in New York so why have they changed because you've said do what you think will will be best for this market well they're reading the newspapers they're reading the press they're listening to things like this which is telling them that they can and clearly they are close enough to head office that they can say can we really and the answer is yeah if, if you do it well get on with it and, and so they have that's really exciting i would think they seem them. to be they seem to be quite energetic um you know, we, we've just been shown to a place to have this interview by two seem to me to be quite energized happy and, and, and not in the first flush of youth booksellers. These are people who've been knocking around for the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. And they seem pretty happy with the freedoms they've got and think that they're doing a, a, a good... You know, clearly it's the first steps, but they're clearly beginning to change the store. And if we have teams up and down the land doing that, it, we will begin to see a change. They, they still... 
Yeah, clearly you're in a, in a very underinvested store. You know, the escalators bust, <laughs> the elevators bust, <laughs> the lighting ain't great. You know, so that you know, we need to, at some point, lavish some expenditure on them. But in the meantime, they're just using a bit of brain power and shifting the books around and making it more attractive. And it took you to come in to make this happen? Yes, um, because I'm not a corporate individual and all I want is to allow and equip and empower booksellers to run their stores better. And they're a lot, lot better at doing it than the central direction that comes from a, from a corporate head office. I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Uh, I, I figured the, the culture would be different over here. The, than than it is it was in in England in Waterstones, five, eight seven eight years ago. No, it's ex it's exactly the same. I think booksellers are a tribe that is very recognisable. They have the same skills. They say the same vocational interests. They have you, know, you go around the world talking to booksellers all the time, mm. uh, and they're the same people everywhere. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that if you say to a bunch of booksellers, uh, and luckily I speak their language, so it's a lot easier for me to. Well, with a different accent, <laughs> but it's the same language. Get on with it. Make your shops attractive. They will do so. And they weren't given that freedom before. Well, no, because it's been run by retailers who come from other retailing backgrounds and other retailing in sectors, who've brought the disciplines of those sectors, which really matter in those sectors, to book selling where it doesn't matter. If you're running. GNC, which sells vitamin supplement tablets and all the rest. When you walk into a GNC and you want to get the vitamin that makes your hair grow, you really want to find it all lined up in the right place, in the right order, and to be the same, irrespective of whether you go into the vitamin store in Dallas or in Houston or in New York City or anywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, and that works really well, and it works for apparel retailers and it works for pretty much everybody. But it does not work for books. And the trouble with these bookstores is they've been run by people from Staples and other places. Why doesn't and it work for books? Because one, the product range is so extraordinarily diverse, millions of titles, as you well know. Uh, and then the reading uh, interests and the communities around a particular country as large as this is, ex is very diverse. Yeah. And you have to marry one to the other. Whereas if you want to eat a tablet with your breakfast cereal every morning that makes your hair grow, it's the same tablet everywhere. Yeah. But that isn't true with books. And you're saying that because it, it's comforting to the consumer, if all these stores look the same and you can go to the same place and get it, whether you're in Los Angeles or Dallas or Boston. Yeah, if I want shampoo. Yeah. I want to go straight the there same. and get it, and I want the same uh, brand. And and yeah. I want to, you know, and I want to yeah. know. And if I'm buying, you know, I, I want the same things. But right. that isn't true for books. No, because as you say, they're all different. And that, I mean, once you realise that, which clearly every single independent bookseller knows, once you just and and indeed every single bookseller, shop for a bookseller who works for a train, they know that as well. It's just that's not what the management ever knew. This seems so obvious, but <laughs> it is. The really good news is if you're the person who does realize that and you come in and you say, right, get on with it, guys, then everybody thinks you're clever. Well, I mean, clearly everyone already thinks you're clever because of what you've already done. Or, or rather not done. Right. What I, it, it's what I don't do that's the clever bit. It's I don't. You don't impose things from a, a central... Okay. Okay. So I'm one of those few lucky people who the less they do, the cleverer they seem. <laughs> okay. You must be damn excited, though. It's quite fun when you come into places where it's working. It's less fun when it's you're in the bits that don't work. You know, it's, there, like, there are also the whole... Uh, the We've seen the, the, the elevator not working and the escalator not working and the lights out. And, you know, that, that stuff that isn't working, when that's actually the IT infrastructure and the logistics infrastructure then there is quite a lot of hard technical work that needs to go on in the background to equip these guys to do a good job and that's actually what my job is uh, my job is to take away all the controls and, and the nonsense from the shop floor and then go and spend some hard hours fixing all the technical stuff that will equip them to do that job better 
equips them to receive books in a timely fashion in the right quantity through a, a logistics network which is as low cost and as efficient as possible and, and all the rest have IT systems which help them and, and equip them to work. So that's actually the job. And that's not working now? Well, no, because just the same as the escalator doesn't work, nor does the IT system. This is a business which has been starved of capital and investment. So what's the problem with uh, the IT system? Well, it's just old. So what does that mean? It's well, slow? If, if, if it's old, it's very fragile and it's very slow. And if you breaks down all the breaks time. Breaks down all the time. And if you try and search for a book on the website, you don't find it. And Amazon is like grease lightning and that's the competitor. So there's, there's a lot to fix. Okay. So my question here, how does the challenge compare to what you've done with Waterstones? It's the same challenge? Yeah, it's a bigger beast, uh, evidently, but I think basically, fundamentally, the challenge is, is extremely similar. Um, but there are more stores, the stores are bigger, and the geography is bigger, the DCs are bigger, uh, so everything is a, is a bit bigger. But then Waterstones is quite a bit bigger than Tom Books. Yes, <laughs> right. Where do you go from here? <laughs> so how much do you spend on rent? How much does Barnes & Noble spend on rent? Do they own anything? No, they own nothing. Right. Uh, no more than Waterstones owns anything. I mean, the, the, the basic mathematics of, of retailing, uh, book retailing, is you, you need to try and get your rent you know, as close as you can to 10% of your sales. Um, you can, perhaps you can make it work all, all the way up to 15%, but you really have to be working somewhere around your occupancy costs in, in, in the low, uh, close, as close as you can to 10%. And where is it now? Um, it's, a, it's a bit higher than that. Um, so, so but but, but the, the real problem with these is you, you've got to align your whole cost structure, be that you know, what you spend on your people, which is clearly the variable cost, what you're doing through. And, but, but this is a business... You know, because it's got a very inefficient processes in place, there's a lot of cost in that. And if you're returning 25% of the books you buy, yes. there's a lot of cost in that. What's um, the return rate for the... 22, 23% ah, goes perfect. around. Just yeah, again, the same idea. You said you've got it down to what, three or four? It's between three and four, depending on, on when you measure it, but it's basically about 3%. If you remove that, then a lot of labor goes from your stores, a lot of really unproductive, difficult, all the freight changes, your DC, your logistics operation changes. You know, a lot of things are just embedded in the in inefficiency. But it's not the returns that particularly matter. It's that you're buying badly and you're filling your stores with books that your customers don't want to buy. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's actually the problem. And that's what the publishers don't mind at all because you're putting their books out in front of as many people as... Uh, well, they they do mind because you send all the books back that you haven't sold and actually you sell less overall if you do that uh, but they don't trust you to choose and select and to merchandise sensibly and appropriately they just don't trust that so it's better to play safe and just dump the books everywhere yeah but it's up to the buyer to determine how many you buy uh, yes but at the moment that's driven by the imperative of the commercial relationship what's that mean? Um, I need to get so many co-op dollars and promotional dollars for putting a book everywhere. That's both what I've been held to account for internally and actually what drives my bottom line. So rather than put out a sensible number in the sensible shops, I put them absolutely everywhere in turn for the, for the check from the publisher for doing so. That's the basic problem. You want that check? Yeah, but it's also clearly, it's, it's more complex and it's more subtle. But, yeah. but that's basically the structure that's embedded, uh, even if you know, in reality quite a lot of those things are relaxed. Um, but but still, the institution operates in that way, uh, and, it, and it's totally unnecessary. So, w what have you done to to uh, placate or calm down the publishers? I, I don't Anything? think there's. I don't think there's any particular panic. Maybe you'll tell me otherwise. But <laughs> you know, I think they. They recognise that Barnes & Noble needs to become a much more dynamic retailer than it presently is. Clearly sales have been declining each and every year for a very long time and that can't go on forever. Yeah. The mathematics of that decline has, has actually got not very much further to go. 
uh, and they don't want Barnes and Noble to disappear. No. And we, no one does. There clearly is a recipe to turn that around and make it a profitable business again, and that will help everybody. So I don't think publishers are panicking. I don't think that they need reassurance. They're just you know hoping that we will do some sensible and logical things to make ourselves a better bookseller, and that's absolutely what we intend to do. So how are you going to do that? Well, that's what we've started just, to just do. What we've talked about. Yeah, it's just, because it seems to me that you know, looking at this store, they've got a big crowd of people in here for a well-known author. Uh, the place is is busy. In fact, you know, yeah. I tried to get some customer service and it took me, but that was because there were other customers being served. Yeah. So it's a it's a busy, busy spot. How can you make it busier? Well, it's a busy spot, but. A, a if you've got a store that's set up to sell them more books rather than less books, if you've got them set up in a way that makes them want to come back tomorrow, next weekend, that are you creating a place in which people feel really comfortable and at home? And if you are, they'll come back more often and they'll spend more with you. So the, the idea really is to come up with as many ideas as you can to keep them in the store. Mm -hmm. Make the stores as attractive as possible. Energize and... Uh, inspire the booksellers to be as proactive as possible and as friendly and dynamic as possible and you know, there's a certain amount of work to be done there yeah yeah get the right books displayed attractively that's what we're trying to do okay. work with publishers to, to to get all of the channels and, and all of the levers and tools that we have within within our trade and that's how we email people and how the website works as well as naturally and most crucially all the things that we do within the bookstore itself yeah there's readings um and, and you talked about the the staff that you have same same in england and the states it's the same tribe and they've got book clubs here it seems like they've got them everywhere uh, every barnes and noble i've been to yeah i mean and then the thing i would say was whereas in Woodson's there are book clubs going on but every store is doing its own book here oh, is the book Margaret Atwood's book was a, a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, and well, I, you know, and I have the highest admiration for, for Margaret Atwood. I think it's wonderful. Would definitely be the book club I would join. But is that going to be really true in all parts of the country? I would doubt it. I see, I didn't realize it. So again, it's about individual stores connecting with their communities. Yeah. yeah. What happens if you're a Spanish language community? Well, maybe you choose a different sort of book. <laughs> yes. Is there anything you can do to improve the customer experience? There's certainly a lot. I think the stores, we're in a very attractive one, and, and one that is a lot more attractive than it was two weeks ago, simply by moving the furniture and moving the stuff around. So you can do that simply with what I call the beer and pizza route. You give your booksellers some beer and some pizza and tell them to put on their jeans and bring in some scrappy t-shirts and then start shoving the furniture around and make the place look more attractive. That's pretty simple stuff. How does it? Look, how does this look more attractive than it did before? Uh, it's a lot of the fixturing has been taken out, and they brought in a lot more tables, and they've taken out a lot of the what we call corrugates. And What's that mean? Uh, it's it's basically um, the, the supplier you know, of say scented candles gives you a cardboard piece of thing that you put together with all the scented candles on it. Okay. And you know, we checked all of that stuff out and brought in some tables and filled them up with books. That makes the atmosphere a lot more bookish and a lot more interesting and the browsing nicer and it opens the place out. So you can definitely do physical changes. You can then start really trying to display your books attractively, uh, focus on doing what, that. What does that mean? Well, it means having the right book space out. It means filling up the tables with the right selection of books, really trying to curate your, your store visually uh, for your customer base and yeah, that's was, what book selling is but I was fascinated when you said that it's a visual it's visual and you would you take the glasses off and you would just see a, a blur of color yeah it's how would that differ from from you know Boston to, to Dallas well it doesn't but it, what you're trying to do is rather than say every single store must look like this you're saying guys make it look as attractive as you possibly can move the books around make it sing based um, on based on your what yeah, sensibility your, yeah absolutely it's down to each individual book selling bookseller and book selling team to do that make the place look 
good, make it interesting, make, try and put a smile on people's faces, make it funny, put things out. Okay. That's what makes a place interesting. And then if you actually talk to your customers, say hello to them, not keep them waiting. Uh, if you have to keep them waiting, do so in a charming way, answer your telephone, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. There's a myriad of, of all of the, the ways in which customer service uh, and how booksellers interact with their customer bases. Now, independents get this absolutely, instinctively, or they don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a store in Burlington, Vermont, that, uh, that I, I love because it's got a second-hand section. Uh, is that something you're going to look at expanding or not? I think that's tough. It's a really, really complicated, difficult, um, it can make stores brilliant beyond belief if you do it well it can destroy like the strand them. does yeah or, or, but if you do it badly it makes them worse um, so we've got a few Waterstones where we do it now a um, couple where we do it a lot but we've got people who know what they're doing who've got real taste who've got real discipline because it's that is a really tough I mean that's like you know PhD and beyond levels of book selling once you're doing that yeah and if you're in elementary and school you don't take a PhD yeah, you it's, it's years it. of apprenticeship. It's years, yeah. and it's brilliant, but it's tough, tough stuff. And, and I love a bookstore that can do that, but they're you know they are geniuses. I agree. I agree. It's it's you know if, even if you want to make money on your own do, trying to do that, you just try that. You try to buy a book and then make a profit at it. Yeah, it's tough. And the curation that goes around it, and the the, the reality that. Your customers buy all your good books all the time, so you're constantly being left with the less <laughs> yes, good. Right. And how do you? Yeah, you have to keep you buying really good books. You really have to. Do, yeah. Oh my goodness, it's a discipline. Yeah. Okay. When I came in here, the the cafe was jam packed. I couldn't find a seat. So do you like that? Yeah. Well, I love anything that brings people into a bookstore and has them having fun and the buzz of conversation and and yeah, I mean, cafes if you've got the space to do it and you're not turfing out range and the stock that you should otherwise have have a cafe and people will be there and it's it changes the mood of a store during the hours as well it's a different crowd in the morning different crowd in the afternoon after school you get all the kids in the teenagers in and then in the evening you've got the young crowd and yeah, and they're, they're good things what about wine you bring uh, that in well in um in the united states of america they are astonishingly puritanical still about alcohol so you have to have a license and you have to all of those good things and that's quite tough so in fact wine is not part of the mix here whereas in the UK and um, you can you can just ladle out the wine any which way you like and so there's a lot of it <laughs> so lots of uh, Waterstones sell wine uh, we tend to so all book launches and things we have wine some of them actually sell um, you always have to be you know, th there is a complication around alcohol in there. so you, you actually have a whole layer of extra controls that go around it so no not in all by any means but in some in particularly in our metropolitan cities where you've got the late night crowd most of the Waterstones books at the bookshops close at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. so no alcohol is not part of it. Okay how many stores in total uh, Barnes & Noble? Uh, it's all changing steadily because they're opening and closing here but 637 at the moment. And uh, are, are you going to close a bunch of them or not? I would hope so, um, but to relocate and open new ones. Um, and part of the Waterstones success has been we have actually closed an awful lot of stores, but we've opened more than we've closed, so the net number has been going up. Uh, but clearly having shiny new stores is much better than having really old ones. Uh, so part of the process has been to either close and open, relocate, down the road, definitely close by with a new store, and then you can you can get them to the right size because a lot of the Barnes and Noble stores are just simply too big. Uh, it used to clearly a third of the business was in music um, and film, DVDs and things, and that business has gone. Um, yeah. It's still there's a there's a remnant of it, but you do not need a third of a store devoted to it. So the stores, are, a lot of them are too big, and ideally you'd either shrink them um, or you'd move them. Yeah, but moving is always better. What about Nook? We can do a Nook. I'm a great fan of Nook. I mean, actually, now I use it, which in a way is, it's, I find the uh, the app works for me very nicely. Um, it's, yeah, with proofs and things, you have to read electronically. I much prefer reading the physical book, but yeah. you don't get a choice for a lot of the time. 
Um, and also, I don't care how I sell reading. I'm in the business of selling reading. I also yeah. don't care. Yeah, I want to sell the book that a customer wants to read. And if they want to read some trashy romance, I'll sell them trashy romance. If they want to read a thriller, I'll sell them a thriller. If they want to read literary, I'll sell them literary. I'm trying to match the right book to the right person. Now, if a person wants to read an e-book in electronics, well, I'll sell them an e-book, which I can't do in the UK. You're going, to bring, you're going to bring the nook over to... Uh, I, I mean, at the moment, that's you know, plenty of other things to do before trying to work out how one might do that. Okay. Um, but, you know, this, this, it's, it's not a bad experience now, and, and it was their money they lost creating it, not mine, so, you know, <laughs> that might so, be a bad It's already sunk, yeah, yeah. It's gone. Yeah, last time around you mentioned that the that the way that you choreograph a store, a child could find their way around without. I, I was really intrigued with that. I wanted you to expand on that a bit. I think it's always important that, that it, a, a store feels intuitive, and that's essentially that's about how you um, juxtaposition your sections and how you flow your stock through the store. And I think you should always sort of be able to. When you're looking at a whether you're looking at a table or you're looking at a shelf, something about it, you should instinctively know what's to right and left, and when you go to right or left, that it all makes sense. So can you give me an example of that? Well, the the, the and, and I think it's also within the flow of sections. So we arrange. Um, do you put a biography of Castro in biography under C, or do you put it in biography under the author? alphabetical or do you in fact put it in history under Cuban history and is that in a history section that's arranged by country or is it arranged chronologically or is it arranged A to Z by author all of these things by ideology. really matter or by yeah. ideology yeah. or now I think you can do it you can do that in many different ways and, and I actually come from a tradition where I arrange my bookstores by country which yes. is like seriously bonkers but it makes sense because what, if you're interested in Argentina, you might also be interested in Chile? No, if you're interested in Argentina, you're interested in Argentinian fiction and history and cooking. Oh, and so you heavy thing. up, okay, you heavy so, up, you do all the different categories under the country. Yes, I don't, so I have no history section because history is by every single country. country. It's so country. I come from a world where my belief is, as long as it's logical, there are many different ways of doing it. But it has to be logical. Whereas I now come into a business where it's not logical, I don't think in any intuitive sense. You cannot have, as is here, a history A to Z by author. That makes no sense to me at all. We go upstairs, they still, they've grouped all their new titles, and it's A to Z by author. Well, I want to see what the new business books are. Mm. I don't want to go from A all the way to Z, which is like about... 10,000 books. I want to have my business books together and then I want to have it within that curated in a way that makes intuitive sense to me. And there are different ways of doing it. Like the different I industrial sectors, yeah. for example. Or, you know, all the new books on digital and the way the world is all going, Facebook and Googling and all the rest. I want those together. I don't want to... But, but so you're just going to, you're going to talk to each one of these individual managers and say, this is the idea. Now you yeah. you do the specifics. You do the specifics because I can't. Your and, and the thing that's dictating how you do it is often the physical geography of your store, where you turn a corner when you get a run and it goes sideways. You want to end those at the corner. You don't want to wrap around. So I've now got to put eight bays, which is how long it is before it wraps around. Well, what do I put in eight bays to make real sense of it? What do I do when I go if I've got an upstairs or downstairs and things? I shouldn't be doing that. They have to do that. Plus, they know their customers. So, how? What kind of a store is it? This is a really metropolitan one, clearly. Um, how do you, you know, how do you make this store sing for this customer base? Well, I should not. What I need to do is say, put your thinking cap on and really work it out. <laughs> I mean, you were saying earlier that you would you you were down at uh, McNally Jackson. You know, they've got a weird old arrangement down there. But it works. It's absolutely intuitive. You understand it instantly. But it's not normal. Well, normal compared to what? Well, normal compared to anything, actually. But it's <laughs> but it's really interesting. It's totally inspiring. 
it's kind of genius and it's great and that's what we need to start doing here and I'm not saying copy them because no. it's bananas but for them it's brilliant well, and, we and need for to, their customers it's oh, yeah, brilliant too they, I you, guess they love it you know, I love it you can't walk in there without walking out with a book it's great because it's showing them in a different way we have to in, come up with our own version in each and every one of our stores but it won't be the same everywhere okay finally because um, I know you're in a bit of a rush and I really appreciate you. <laughs> so <are> you. <laughs> you talked about the fact that there was there was the goal of making money, but there's also a greater goal, and you alluded to combating populism. Remember that? I mean, I do think that bookstores are have a place within a community, have a role within a community. I don't think it's as important as libraries. For example, in terms of promoting uh, reading and learning and culture and engagement, uh, in terms of that sort of combating populism, I certainly think we are places in which, not from a necessarily so much an overt political standpoint, but certainly one from a, a uh, espousing community and uh, liberal values, I do think bookstores have a, a clear purpose. Um, and. It's about tolerance and understanding and, and all of those good things, I think, are embedded within a bookstore. And, and bookstores have nothing to do with the opposite of that. And the, that's what we're seeing is sort of extremism and intolerance. And, and racism and exclusion and all of yeah. those things are definitely... Fear. Uh, and and the, the absolute uh, antithesis of what a bookstore should embody and, and that's really why book selling at the heart of it I think is a vocational trade I think that not everybody clearly there are bookstores which may choose to actually celebrate all of those negative things and you and, and they can very do so very powerfully there is, a reason, celebrate there is a reason why the Nazis piled up the books and burnt them and why in fact everybody of that sort eventually start burning books there is a reason for that it's why writers are the first to get it in the net when dictators take over uh, writing is very very powerful and well it's when, independent thought isn't it and we are not writers clearly we are further down the food chain but we are the purveyors of writing and we're the purveyors of ideas and i think therefore we are also people who stand for for tolerance and understanding and community so you gonna run for office or no, I'm a bookseller, I'm gonna stay in my bookshop selling books. But hopefully I will uh, create a culture in which the better amongst politicians and the like succeed rather than the worst. Okay. Have you, is there anything else you wanna say? I, mean, I, I think it's 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 gonna be interesting to see whether this works. Um, you know, I think bookshops really need to support. Um, and, and we are in this curious world where the big chain in the UK, the big chain here, is really quite important. You know, I, I think it would be better if they weren't, but they are. You know, it's just the accident of how things have, have uh, unraveled. Uh, in the US, there are more independents, and uh, the sector is, but it's still quite small, you know, and it's quite small compared even to the overall scale and size of Barnes and Noble, and that's why it matters. What percentage is the in independence? Do you know? Well, I actually, within the world of books, I never believe the statistics anyway. Well, yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, they are you know, roughly, I think, around 11, 12 percent of the market. Um, Barnes and Noble is maybe double that, and, and you uh, you then read another thing which gives you sort of the opposite kind of numbers. So yeah. I'm never quite sure. Uh, okay. But but self evidently, there are enormous numbers of communities around where Barnes and Noble is the only. And, and therefore, it, it it's kind of important that it survives. Okay, so once you've turned it around and it's thriving, what then what are you going to do? And hopefully, go back to doing books. Okay, well, that's thanks. certainly where I'm happiest. Well, thank you for taking on the uh, the challenge. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's inspiring just to listen to you, really. Well, hardly that, but it's it's quite fun. Thanks again. Thanks very much.